good morning church, church family, friends, community. As Jane mentioned, today I'm truly blessed to be sharing the sermon with Ethan. And Ethan and I will be speaking to you about the last in the series of creation. Colette and I kick-started the series. We spoke about creation versus created. Um, Pastor Paul then considered intelligent design and the reasons for a young earth. Nathan and Pastor Paul spoke about everything having a cause. And today, Ethan and I will be speaking about creation to new creation. If you have your Bibles, get them out. We're going to get straight into it, straight into the word. Please open your Bible. We're going to be opening up at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 17 and 18. Now I'm going to be specifically reading from the New King James Version. So that's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. I just love those verses. Paul makes a statement that applies to each and every one of us. If we are in Christ, we are a new creation. So the question is, what about those who are not in Christ? And this is what I truly love about God, he always gives us a choice. And here we have two options we can choose. We can either be in Christ or not be in Christ. And that very word, behold, it stipulates that it is an exciting revelation from God. This is something that God offers to each and every one of us. In Galatians, Paul returns to this theme. So let's turn to Galatians chapter 6, verse 15. And I'm just reading the second part of it. Paul says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. You see, the only thing that really matters is a new creation. Re religious ceremonies, they just don't do it. You see, the legalists in the Galatian Christian community considered circumcision as a big deal because it was the initiation to living under the Mosaic law. But yet Paul knew that it was not the most important thing. The question is, have you become a new creation in Jesus Christ? But for us to fully understand being a new creation, we first have to start back by going back to creation. And so let's go back to the beginning. We know that very famous verse in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And in my first sermon on creation, I reminded you that only God, no one else, only God can create. You see, as people, we can make, we can design, we can develop or produce things, but only God can create something from nothing. Friends, please stay with me because I want to point out something really important. Please turn with me. We're going to stay in Genesis for a while. So we're looking at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
Now, I'd like to suggest the first tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This was a tree that was planted by God. Now, just turn over with me to chapter 3 and verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to, gave to her husband with her, and he ate. We see that through this very act, sin entered this world. But it did much more than separate us from God. The result of sin in our lives meant that it cannot be repaired or improved. The only thing that allows for restoration is a creative act. And this can only come from God. Yared explains that this tree of the knowledge of good and evil was good and pleasing to the eye. And it also refers to it as being a source of food. Yet approximately 4,000 years later, the very tree that Jesus was nailed to, the second tree, this tree was planted by man. It was human hands which devised, provided, and erected that very cool, cruel tree on the hill of Calvary. Here we see the suffering Savior, the taunting priests, the two thieves, the blood and the darkness. And clearly, so clearly, these were not pleasing to the eye. When Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it led to humanity's curse. But friends, there's more. Please turn with me to the book of John. John, and we're having a look at chapter 6. And we're looking at verses 53 and 54. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Friends, what is exciting is when we eat from the second tree, this is the tree that provides eternal life. Friends, Jesus is, he is the answer to all of our questions. It is Jesus who restores. It is Jesus who saves us. And through Jesus, our sins are forgiven. We even see this in Psalm 51 when David is crying out with a heart of repentance. When David was found to be guilty of adultery and murder, he cries out to God and he says, God, God, please create in me a new heart. You see, when sin has damaged our lives, we can ask people for forgiveness. We can turn over a new leaf, so to say. We can try to change our ways. But what is really required is a creative act that can only come from God. When we open up ourselves to God, when we recognize that there is nothing, there is nothing that we can do in our own strength, when we acknowledge our total dependence on God, then our God of grace, our God of faithfulness. Our God brings about the new creation. When we truly believe in Jesus Christ, we are transformed into that new creation. And this is when we start to see our true potential through Christ. And this is when we start to see miracles. It reminds me of a story that I would like to share with you. In 2017 on the Gold Coast, parents Jazz and Joseph had 
a newborn son. Joseph believed in God because he was brought up in a Catholic home. But Jazz, she had no religion. She never believed in any form of God. She didn't think that God was real until that day when she saw her newborn son nearly die in the hospital. Their son, Mark, was born on the 6th of April. But shortly after being discharged from hospital, Mark contracted Group B streptococcal infection. Now, this is a, a sickness that can occur in labor. And thereafter, baby Mark contracted meningitis and septicemia. And he started to have seizures. Jazz saw her son Mark stop breathing three times. It was truly a traumatic experience for them. Jazz had never considered praying. She thought that she could do everything in her own strength and in her own way. But Joseph, on the other hand, he believed that God could perform miracles and he encouraged his wife to pray with him. He was convicted that God would not let their baby die. The doctors had told Jazz and Joseph, if Mark could survive until the next morning, he would be okay. But if not, he would die. Unfortunately, that bat bacterial infection caused brain damage. And therefore, the doctors believed that Mark could become either deaf or blind with a very high possibility of having cerebral palsy. It was the start of a miracle because Mark was alive the next day. Jazz said that baby Mark could initially not even move for several months. But at the age of 10 and a half months, he was crawling and standing up. Mark was diagnosed with cerebral visual impairment. But even that is still improving even today. He can now see his parents and respond to them without them speaking. Jazz was later baptized into the Catholic Church. And she said, when you look for God, God is there. Friends, when we have a problem with a watch, we take it to the watchmaker. When we have something wrong with our bodies, with ourselves, it is important that we go to the body maker. Jesus himself healed many, and he still does so today. Jesus is not only involved in creation, but he is central to it. Paul tells us in Colossians that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created. In the Old Testament, if we go as far back as Isaiah, it says that God will create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But this is also confirmed in John's vision in the book of Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Paul also confirms this when he writes in Peter that according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The new creation will be fulfilled throughout the entire universe. Creation from the beginning of history to new creation allows us to see that creation isn't just a background of scripture. It is the story of salvation. Creation started in Genesis 1. It fell in Genesis 3. There were groans. There was mourning. And then the new creation. It became a reality in Jesus Christ. And we look forward to the complete restoration of the entire universe when Jesus returns. Creation flows throughout the biblical narrative and without the full understanding of creation, 
we cannot fully understand the biblical narrative. Friends, let us honor God for putting in place the perfect plan to take us from creation to new creation. But let us also praise God for making us a new creation when we are in Christ. So let's pause. What does it mean for each one of us to be a new creation? It means that when we put our trust in Jesus Christ, we become an entirely new person. We have a new peace, a new comfort, a new strength, a new hope, and new promises to hold on to. We are no longer separated from God, but we now come boldly before God as his sons and daughters. When we are a new creation, we have a new motivation. And the big question is, how are we motivated today? There's been a lot of studies and research on motivation over the years, but it's still a real puzzle. I don't know if you've seen a really good TED talk from a guy called Dan Pink. He's one of the world's experts in motivation. He's got six New York Times bestsellers and is the former speechwriter for President Al Gore. Now the talk is called The Puzzle of Motivation and it's got more than 32 million views online. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend that you do. He talks about the systems of motivation that our businesses and more broadly our world is built on. Now this is called the candle problem. It was created in 1945 by a psychologist named Carl Duncker. He created this experiment that is used in many other experiments in behavioral science. Here's how it works. You're given a candle, some thumbtacks and some matches. Your job is to attach the candle to the wall so the wax doesn't drip onto the table. Now, what would you do? Many pe people began trying to thumbtack the table to the, sorry, the candle to the wall. Doesn't work. Maybe melt the side of the candle, try to stick it to the wall. No. And eventually most people figure out the solution, which you can see here. The key is to overcome what's called functional fictionness. You look at that box and you see it only as the thing to hold the tax, but it can also have this other function as the platform for the candle. Now I want to tell you about an experiment using the candle problem. It was done by a scientist named Carl, sorry, Sam Glucksberg from Princeton in the US. It shows the power of incentives. So he gathered his participants and said, I'm going to time you, how quickly you can solve this problem. To one group, he said, I'm going to time you to establish a baseline, a control for how long it typically takes someone to solve this sort of problem. To the second group, he offered rewards. He said, if you're in the top 25% of the fastest times, you get $5. How much faster did this group solve the problem? Well, it took them on average three and a half minutes longer. This makes no sense, right? If you want people to perform better, you reward them. Bonuses, commissions, whatever, incentivize them. That's how business works. You've got an incentive designed to sharpen thinking and accelerate creativity, and it does just the opposite. It dulls thinking and blocks creativity. These motivators, if you do this, then you get that, work sometimes. But for a lot of tasks, they don't work. Glucksberg did another similar experiment, but he presented the problem in a slightly different way. Attach the candle to the wall so the wax doesn't drip onto the table. Same as before, one group, your control, other group, here's five dollars. Now it's so much easier to finish the task when the tax are out of the box, right? You can see that you have the option to use the box as a container. Now, what happened this time? Well, this time, the incentivized group did so much better. If then rewards work really well for those sorts of tasks, where there's one real answer, a clear destination to go to. Rewards, by nature, that they narrow our focus and concentrate our mind. That's why they work in so many cases. So for tasks like this, a narrow focus where you just see the goal right there, zoom straight ahead to it, get your 
$5. They work really well. To work it out, you don't want to be looking like this though. This goes for a lot of things in life too. The solution is on the periphery. You want to be looking around. That reward actually narrows our focus and restricts the possibilities. Let me give you an example of another way of motivating. Professor Dan Ehrlich did a study of some MIT students. They gave these students a bunch of games that involved creativity, motor skills, and concentration. These sorts of things are ones they, these sorts of tasks are ones that they do in psychological exams, etc. And they offered them for performance three levels of rewards small, medium, and large, depending on how well you do. Well, what happened? Well, the tasks with mechanical skill bonuses worked as they would be expected. The higher the pay, the better the outcome. Once the task requires really any cognitive skill, a larger reward led to a much poorer performance. And they said, well, let's go to India and test it. Standard of living is lower, so a reward that is more modest in American standards is gonna be a lot more meaningful over there. Same deal, bunch of games, three levels of rewards, etc. What happens? Well, people offered the medium reward did no better than the people offered the small rewards. But this time, people offered the highest rewards. They did the worst of all. In eight of the nine tasks they examined across three experiments, higher incentives led to worse performance. There's another approach built more around intrinsic motivation, around the desire to do things because they matter, because we like it they're interesting or part of something that we find important. This new operating system revolves around three elements, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy, which is the urge to direct our own lives. Mastery, which is the desire to get better and better at something that matters. And purpose, when we want to do something in the service of something larger than ourselves. These are those building blocks. There is something called the results only work environment. In a row, people don't have schedules. They show up when they want. They don't have to be in the office at a certain time or any time, really. They just have to get their work done. How they do it, when they do it, where they do it is totally up to them. Well, what happens? Well, almost across the board, productivity goes up, work engagement goes up, satisfaction goes up, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. They are the building blocks of a new way of doing things. But some of you might look at that and say, that sounds nice, but it can't be possible. Well, in the mid 1990s, Microsoft started an encyclopedia called Encarta. They had deployed all the right incentives. They paid professionals to write and edit thousands of articles. Managers oversaw the whole thing to make sure it came in on budget and on time. But a few years later, another encyclopedia got started, different model. This time you do it for fun and no one gets paid you do it because you want to, you do it because you like it. This was called Wikipedia. Now, which one have you heard of before? To leave you with one last thought. The battle is between these two approaches, intrinsic motivators versus extrinsic motivators. Carrot and the stick, well, autonomy, mastery and purpose versus the carrot and the stick. Who wins? Intrinsic motivation, autonomy, mastery, and most importantly, purpose. Wow, Ethan, thank you so much for that very interesting message. Friends, this highlights to me that we require a new approach in sharing the gospel message with people. If we want to motivate people, if we want to be motivated, we have to appeal to what grows people, what grows us what makes a difference in people's lives and what gives people that very purpose that Ethan spoke about. This is such an important message for us to hear today because not everyone responds to receiving a reward. But friends, I believe that receiving a reward and specifically the reward of salvation so often we see that as happening sometime in the future. But I believe that God is calling us to experience a little bit of heaven on earth right now. He is calling us today to live with joy, to live with hope, and to live with purpose. 
if we focus on what a transformed life looks like and how to make a difference in people's lives, this will motivate us to know Christ even more. Sometimes when our focus is on Jesus' second coming, this can often frighten people because people focus on the persecution and on the calamity which is yet to come. But friends, instead of being fearful, let us be focused on being a new creation and let us trust in God for his protection both today but also for whatever the future holds. God tells us that with him all things are possible. So let us trust and believe in him. You know, 2020 here in Australia, things started with those catastrophic fires. And since then, we have seen and experienced COVID-19, as well as the impact on people, on lifestyles, on families, and on the economy. Nobody expected a year like this. Friends, with the easing of restrictions, we are seeing the slow rollout of the new COVID normal. But it's also a time for us to experience a new beginning, a new physical, a new emotional, and a new spiritual beginning. Friends, I want to encourage you. If during lockdown, you have not exercised, Let's start by walking one kilometer. Now, if you've already walked a kilometer, I'd like to ask you to walk two. If you are anything like me, you've overeaten. I would like to encourage you to eat less. Create a meal plan. But friends, even more importantly, I'd like us to stop and breathe and ask that question that, are, that is on all of our hearts and our minds. Why has God allowed COVID-19? Some people have asked whether it is the end of the world. Friends, I believe it is the beginning of the end. In the Bible, God always provided a warning before anything of significance occurred. And friends, I believe that this is the warning. Yes, it is a warning, but it's not a warning that sends everyone into fear. No, it's a warning of a new beginning. A new beginning for each and every one of us to be God's new creation. Friends, while I was preparing the sermon, God placed an invitation on my heart for each and every one of you today. And yes, a personal invitation requires a response. I have an invitation for those of you who have been baptized, but also for those of you who have not been baptized. Please respond if God is placing it on your heart right now to respond to become a new creation. If you have not been baptized, or if you would like to be re-baptized, or to recommit your life through the profession of faith, I would like to ask you, would you like to become a new creation and to declare it publicly after some studies and then baptism? If this is what God is placing on your heart right now, I want to encourage you, pick up your devices, open your laptop, or just click on the chat, the chat function in Zoom. Pastor Paul and I are waiting to hear from you. You can send an SMS or message via chat, but if you don't have the internet, you can call us. We'll be happy to speak to you. As the music is playing, I want you to consider whether this is something that God is prompting you to do now. As people are considering this call, for those of you who have already been baptized, 
I'd like to ask you some questions. Are you a new creation in Christ? Do you have a new hope, a new confidence, a new joy? Do you know that you have been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ? Friends, if you want to be reconciled to God today, to be his new creation, if you want to have that fresh start, a new start, a new beginning, to surrender the things you haven't already surrendered to God, I would like you to raise your hand. And this is a commitment between you and God, even if your camera is switched off. Don't worry about that, because God sees your heart. Keep those hands raised. Keep sending in those text messages. Heavenly Father, today, Today we come to you, Lord, and we praise you as our Lord and Savior who desires for us to be a new creation. To be a new creation in you. Father, you see the hands that are raised. You see those who have requested baptism or rebaptism. You see those who are wanting to make a new commitment to you. A commitment for them to be the new creation that you designed us to be, Lord. Please, Lord, give each person the strength and the courage to be obedient to what you have placed on their hearts. But draw us closer to you, Lord. Bless us and inspire us. Feel free to lower your hands. Today, Lord, we thank you because your mercy is new every day. It is hard sometimes for us to forget the past. We need your power to forget all that lies behind us so that we can intentionally move forward. Lord, you know how our past mistakes have weighed us down. But Lord, set us free from everything and anything that holds us back. Set us free from the pain, the regrets, the anger, the pride, the uh, unforgiveness. But Lord, set us free from being lukewarm. Lord, allow us to be people that show your grace, that show your mercy as you have done to us. Lord, teach us to surrender our lives to you daily. Father God, today on this beautiful Sabbath day, we thank you for hearing our prayers. But Lord, we also thank you for setting us free. We thank you for the call that you've placed on our hearts to be a new creation in Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you, to praise you, and to glorify you as our Lord and Saviour. And we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.